So I want you to imagine that you're at the beach, but rather than it teeming with people, you find that it's eerily empty. You notice a sign warning that dangerous creatures could be lurking beneath the ocean surface. Now, while this may be the image that first came to your mind, what if I told you, rather than sharp teeth, these creatures instead had long, stinging tentacles? Right now, around the world, blooms of jellies are invading our oceans. As our ocean's health continues to decline, this means that there may be less of the commercial fish species we like to consume, and more of these gelatinous organisms. My job as a scientist is to find out why these jelly blooms are occurring, and what our future oceans may look like if they continue to persist. So our story starts in 2014, when scientists from the Northwest Fishery Science Center started to find these strange-looking creatures coming up in their nets off the Oregon coast. Now, for many of these scientists, this was the first time they had ever seen these creatures outside of a textbook. In 2015 and 2016, they started to see a few more of these creatures, but nothing prepared them for what they're about to see in 2017. Thousands of these organisms, known as pyrosomes, were washing up on beaches from Alaska to Northern California. Now, for many beachgoers, they looked like this alien species, and in many ways, they are. Because we've typically seen these creatures in the tropics, rather than the chilly waters off the Oregon coast. So why were they here now? So they're known as pyrosomes, and they're a type of tunicate, which means they may be more similar to humans than we think, as they start out their lives with a backbone. They have a hollow, gelatinous tube-like body, but rather than the stinging cells that most jellies have. They rather have these hair-like projections, known as cilia, that line the inside of that tube. Now, this cilia helps the pyrosome to swim and to feed. Now, pyrosomes can be a few centimeters long to over a meter long. And what's most fascinating about them is they're not just one creature, but many, as they're colonies of these little organisms known as zoids. Now, the zoids all work together to help the pyrosome to swim and to feed. Now, every single day, pyrosomes take part in one of the largest daily migrations on Earth, known as a diurnal vertical migration. During the day, they'll stay at depths of up to 700 meters, and then at night, they'll migrate to the surface to feed. Now, we think this may be a way for the pyrosomes to avoid some of those visually oriented predators that may be lurking during the day, and instead, this allows them to safely feed on the microscopic zooplankton and phytoplankton that they typically like to feed on. But right now, there's only a handful of scientific papers that have ever been published on pyrosomes, which means that we have a lot more work to do to not only understand their distributions, but also their swimming behaviors. Now, while this bloom was interesting to us as scientists, it was even more concerning for the fishing communities that were finding that rather than the pink shrimp, albacore tuna, and salmon that they typically target. They were instead getting nets full of these pyrosomes, and, and there as well as on their lines, which just shows what a magnitude that this bloom is having on not only the coast but also on the livelihoods of these fishing communities. So we may have an issue if these pyrosomes continue to persist on the catches along the west coast in the future. Now there also may be a long-term impact on these ecosystems, as we're finding that pyrosomes were coming up in the bellies of rockfish. Now rockfish sometimes do eat gelatinous organisms along the coast, but pyrosomes are relatively have little nutrition and are mainly made of water. So you can imagine if all they're eating is primarily this water-like creature, they may not have the energy to not only survive but to reproduce in the future. This means that there could be a collapse in rockfish stocks in the future, so it's incredibly important for us to understand the magnitude of this bloom and what its long-term impacts may be. So, how do we study these pyrosome blooms? Well, one way is by using something that you may find at your local store: GoPro cameras. This camera system was developed by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it's equipped with three different GoPros in underwater housings. Now, what's unique about this camera system is that two of the cameras overlap in their field of view. This means that you're getting the same object from two different perspectives. 
Now, since we know the distance between these two cameras, we can collect information such as the pyrosome orientation, their size, and the distance between pyrosomes, so we can fully characterize this bloom. Now, by understanding some of these features, such as how the pyrosomes are swimming in the water and how they're orienting their bodies, we can then incorporate some of those secrets that they have into some of the tools that we use, like submersibles. Now, this camera system was deployed about 15 miles off the Oregon coast to a depth of about 50 meters, and the footage that we captured was absolutely shocking. From the surface to about 10 meters in depth, we didn't see a single pyrosome. But once you start to surpass that 10 meters, you start to see them by the hundreds. We found, in only five hours, almost 1,200 pyrosomes. Now, if you can imagine, this is happening all along the West Coast, and this is just one patch of these pyrosomes. So you can just imagine how many of these pyrosomes may be out there and what impact that may have. We also found that between 25 to 35 meters, we are seeing almost 50% of our pyrosomes. Now, this is, if you think about this, this is a relatively narrow 10-meter depth window. So what may be driving their abundances in this area? Well, one thing may be that there may, it may be temperature-driven, or it could also be that more of that phytoplankton prey that they like to eat is in this area. But we still have a lot more to understand. Now, one of the biggest challenges of studying pyrosomes is that they're extremely patchy. Other days, we go to the same exact location that this footage was taken and not see a single pyrosome. You can imagine this is extremely difficult when we're trying to relay this information back to fishers to tell them where they can most find the best catches. So instead, by understanding where, not only where in the water column they are, we can also use information on where they're located spatially so we can get this idea of how we can help the fishing community further. Now, some ways we can use to collect more of this data, or some equipment we can use to collect more of this data, is smaller camera systems, such as the one I'm showing you here. Now, this camera system is very similar to the one I showed you previously, but it's a lot smaller, which allows us to mobilize more quickly when these blooms occur. Again, that camera system I showed you before is an amazing piece of equipment, but it takes many people to deploy, and it can be time-consuming when you're trying to load it on a research or fishing vessel. By having smaller camera systems that we can mobilize quickly, it allows us to, when these blooms happen, we can go out and capture the most data possible so we can see if the trends you saw in the previous footage are happening at other locations. We can also use a camera system on the other end of the spectrum, known as a remotely operated vehicle. Now, ROVs have been used in the past to discover things that many humans are interested in, such as shipwrecks. And this camera system in particular, the ROV Jason, was used off the Oregon coast at the Axial Seamount, which is about 1,200 meters in depth. This gives us information on not only how deep the pyrosomes are going, but also allows us to answer questions that sometimes we forget about, like what happens when these pyrosomes die? By being able to see the surface of the sea floor, we can understand not only how these pyrosomes, are, how many pyrosomes are dying in these areas, but we can see what creatures may be feeding on them. And also, we can see how they're decomposing. When these creatures are decomposing, they can emit a lot of carbon into our water systems. So this means it's important that we understand what's really happening on that sea floor with these pyrosomes. Now, while this pyrosome bloom was unique, other blooms of jellies are happening around the world at an alarming rate. Our oceans are facing a health crisis like we have never seen before, as they are becoming warmer, more acidic, and oxygen depleted. This is due to causes such as climate change, pollution, and nutrient runoff. These conditions are less suitable for the diverse commercial fish species we like to consume and more suitable for the reproduction and survival of jellies. Right now, scientists predict that our fisheries could experience a collapse by the year 2050, and jelly blooms could be a sign that our oceans are moving in that direction. But if we act now to protect our ocean resources and continue to study how these jelly blooms impact these local ecosystems, we may be able to prevent a life as we do not know it, and a life we do not want to know, a life where our oceans are dominated by jellies. But I challenge you today to take a lesson from the pyrosome. 
these brainless creatures, made almost entirely of water, have been able to unite and use the power of working together to swim hundreds of meters every single day, ultimately achieving their goal of finding food. But if a large part of that colony fails to function, the survival of the pyrosome is unlikely. It comes down to this simple question. Are we going to use the science, technology, and knowledge we have today to influence the decisions we make every single day? Now, while some of these decisions may seem small, such as choosing to carpool or use public transportation on your daily commute, or learning how much water is used in the production of the food that we eat, or even just saying no to single-use plastics, if every single one of us made these decisions, what change could we see in the health of our oceans within our lifetimes? So today, let us unite as a colony of change so that generations to come can experience the same awe and wonder as we do over the strange and mysterious creatures we find in our oceans. Thank you.